All right, my friends, we have here a 1906-07 Stevens Durier. Alan is gonna show us around, give us all the details. Uh, I promise this is a treat. This is not just another old car. There's a lot to learn. It's very fascinating, the engineering, the quality, the luxury, it's all here. So come on along and enjoy the story. Here we go. Alan, what is this thing of beauty you're standing next to? Let's go. This is a 1906-1907 Stevens Durier Model U. Um, it's a big six cylinder motor, uh, 350 cubic inch or so, uh, 60 mile an hour, a luxury touring car, extremely expensive. It's on the order of the three P's, the Packards, the Peerlesses, and the Pierce Arrows. Uh, this was definitely an American Rolls-Royce caliber of automobile. Uh, it was made by Frank Durier. The Durier brothers created the first manufacturing for America for automobiles, where they actually had an assembly line and they made cars. Did they make lots of cars? No, they made very few. So this model here, they probably made 25 of. This was an extremely expensive luxury car. Probably America's first six cylinder motor, a giant six cylinder motor, uh, at a time when most cars were one and two cylinder cars. And if you had a really good car, it was a four cylinder. This is a six cylinder car. It's giant. This is eight or nine foot tall. Uh, just the wealthiest of the wealthy had this car at a time when only you know, one in every 500 to 1,000 people had an automobile to begin with, you would come up with something like this. Wow. Hmm. Wow. All right, well, let's take a walk around. Do you want to start under the hood on this front yes. side here? Let's look this Notice I can lift the here. hood off, and it weighs almost nothing. It's aluminum. Aluminum. Uh, this, this car has an incredible metallurgy um, attributes. Okay. Uh, the Durier brothers created the car, but Stevens Armaments Company is where they got, is where they partnered with to do all the metallurgy. So the aluminum was, was cast without zinc in it. So the aluminum was perfect and light and all the castings are polishable. They're perfect castings. The steel, again, Stevens Armaments made them very, very strong light steels. So instead of uh, dumb irons and things being really heavy duty, they weren't, they were real light. Uh, this is a, a very nimble car, even though it's eight or nine foot tall, pretty, pretty nimble car to steer. Wow. You're not doing that with the cars this big from this era. Mm. So very light car, considering how giant it, it is. Mm -hmm. okay. um, every part was made to be a lifetime part. You know, they were not going to make cars for you every three years and you made, they made you another one. You know, this was a, a car that should last a lifetime. Every part is made with the best material in the world. For example, that's a water pump, probably the largest centrifugal water pump I have ever seen. Hmm. That's more than a foot in diameter made out of bronze. That's just amazing. There's a steering box, uh, not made out of cast iron, made out of aluminum, the steering box. Wow. This water pump uh, is also got a power takeoff and the power takeoff goes to the dash and that is spinning the oil pump on the dash, uh, which is interjecting the oil into the motor. We'll cover that in a little while when we get to the insides. Okay. The water jacket. This is a thermal siphon engine in its basic design, i.e. the water goes in the bottom, right. gets heated up, and comes out the top. So even with no water pump whatsoever, this would be a thermal siphon motor, and it would be automatic water circulation. And even the design of the water pipe on top of the engine, the water that gets here, it, just, it doesn't get to the highest point. It continues to get to the higher and higher and higher point as it, as it heats up. That, yes, okay. that dumps in the top of the radiator. Mm -hmm. And as that honeycombs from the radiator cool the water, it goes back into the water pump down there and is recirculated again. Mm -hmm. And notice on the water, there is no cooling at all from the bottom of the engine to here. So the water jackets are only cooling where the combustion is happening. Right. It's not going anywhere else. So that water is is exactly where it needs to be in these water jackets. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, all the water jackets are copper, so they're 
never going to corrode and go bad. It's a magneto-driven car, and a magneto-driven car means uh, it no need for any battery whatsoever. The only uh, pre thing to start it, we would simply oil that and oil this. Okay. In fact, I'll do that real quick. Let's do it. Okay, so we're going to start it in a little while here. Yep. So I'm going to go ahead and lubricate the, the magneto. Hmm. That's all that's necessary. And we already pre lubed the water pump. Right. Okay, as we go to the front, this is a starter generator. So this is a brand new part. In 1907, 1906, they didn't have any starter generators. Okay. So this was a part that was, this is a 1913 dated starter generator. Uh, the electric starting happened about 1912. Cadillac pretty much was the first big company that had it. Mm -hmm. Other companies also kind of had it at the time, too. They could buy the, the starter generators or the generators as an option. Okay. So this starter generator is doesn't have a Bendix and doesn't have teeth. It simply has a belt that continually spins. So if you reverse the, the power and put a battery onto this generator, it'll slowly start the engine and then the belt continues to go around as the engine is running uh slightly charging the battery too okay so even though it's not correct it's still more than 110 years old so we'll leave it on yeah we'll leave it alone okay fair okay. enough the fan the yeah. fan is an absolute work of art the fan is um just like an airplane propeller of the time beautiful design um, instead of a flat piece of sheet metal with four blades on it, it's eight blades of aluminum that's all stylish, super strong in the design of it, ultra, ultra strong, and there's no movement on it whatsoever. Hmm. That fan, because it's got a rounded tip on the edge of it, right. is, is going to be quiet no matter what RPM you spin it, and it is completely quiet. It's silent. Wow. What a beautiful fan it would could even polish it if we wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the, what's the plumbing we're seeing along the bottom? Okay, what what all that plumbing is on the the copper tubes? Yep. That's of the total loss system. There's an oiler box on the dash, which we'll show when we get around to the insides. There's oil injected in each of the four mains to lubricate it. Okay. So the the oiler's got drippers on it. So it you adjust them to so it's about eight drips per minute. And then you have those drips going into the to the main bearings. You also have some splash occurring on the bottom of the rods too. Okay. And the bottom of the rods, that splash is going to lubricate the mains somewhat. But if you had a long, long uphill or a long, long downhill, uh, you can't rely on the splash being consistent for the front cylinder and the back cylinder. So you always had at least eight drops per minute going into this to the main bearings. I see. Okay. And that, ladies and gentlemen, covers the passenger side, I mean the driver's side, <laughs> the right side of the engine. You keep noticing the steering wheel being on the, on the right side, but that's okay. So this is the... Um this is the working part of the, of the, of the engine. So the, on the top, you're seeing um, the valve caps. These valve caps allow for access to the L-head motor to the intake valve and the exhaust valve, which is below this in the combustion chamber. Mm -hmm. So by releasing the valves from underneath, the valve would come up through the hole that this would make when that's disconnected. I see. You see the hole in the slide? There you do. Okay. Yep. Got it. So you lubricate the valve guide. Okay. A couple plunges. Mm -hmm. And then you close this off. And that's not open anymore. Well, it's just like a, a little thumb screw to, to open and close it. Yep. Okay. So here's this one. So we're doing 
is giving some lubrication to the valve guides. Well, Alan finishes that. I'm going to just go ahead and let the camera float on down to see where these guys are going. And there are the valves. So clearly the cam is down there in the block. I'll bring the cams here and these cams, they, they need a little bit of love every once in a while since they aren't part of the lubrication system during normal running, I guess. Splash is the best. So now we've got those primed. Excellent. We have a, the um, primers, the fuel primers for starting on the top of the engine, like a lot of our really early cars have, but this one is engineered. In almost every case, uh, over the intake manifold, we have the spark plugs, mm -hmm. and over the exhaust manifold, it's typically the primers. In this case, um, they put the primers in the center here, right. and that's kind of funny, but this car is extremely well engineered. So if you had the primers above the exhaust ports and you primed all six cylinders, you'd have at least two of the primes go to waste. Would be in the exhaust, the exhaust would be open on at least two cylinders, mm -hmm. it would go right into the intake manifold, which would cause a backfire. So you would think when you started cranking it, hey, it's gonna start, it's gonna start, but right. it's not because you just dumped fuel into the exhaust. Right, you so did it no good at all. Doesn't help you whatsoever. Yeah. So what Steven Zurier did to alleviate that and make it much more efficient, twice as efficient, they have the primers Ab not above the exhaust pipe, but uh, between the, the two ports here, and there's a trough inside the intake manifold, so this fuel actually goes to the intake manifold on all six of the oh, cylinders. Oh, wow, so they solved it so the fuel's always going to the intake. Right, so when you hand crank it, you mm -hmm. know, it's extremely efficient to hand crank it or use your starter generator, because every single one of the cylinders is primed, not half of them. Right. So it's a so they just looked for every possible engineering feat to make every single thing the best it could possibly be. Right. Wow. This is the intake manifold. Mm. And if I wanted to clean this up and polish it, this is probably really beautiful. Uh, this is cylinder one, two, three, four, five, and six. Right. All pretty much equal runs. Mm -hmm. This We have dual exhaust. So we have an exhaust manifold here. And we have an exhaust manifold here. And we have a pipe there and a pipe there that goes to the muffler. This is a carbureted automobile, except this automobile has no carburetor. <laughs> so the carburetor, this is simply the butterfly up here. Okay. That's just the butterfly. Okay. Okay. Um, there's no fuel in here whatsoever. On the very bottom, there's a float chamber. There's no butterfly down there in the float chamber. There's simply a fire hose, about an eighth of an inch diameter. And in that fire hose, we can adjust it from the dash as far as how much fuel is flowing through that fire hose. Okay. And then by priming it, so you're priming it and you're trying to start it, it's, suction, it's sucking gas from that fire hose float chamber okay. up to this long piece of tubing, which isn't a carburetor, and that's what makes it run. So there's no carburetor whatsoever. If I take this carburetor apart, and we may do that in a short or something, uh -huh. I can lay all these pieces on the counter and you'll see no carburetor whatsoever. So there's no jets? No jets. There's no bowl for holding fuel? There's a bowl for holding the fuel. Okay. And there's a, looks like an intake valve closing that, that float off, going open and closed. Okay. And there's a floating, um, there's a cork in there. Okay, so there is a float. Yeah. And you've got just a, a fire nozzle in the bottom of that chamber. Okay. No idle jet, no mid-range jet, no high-speed jet. You simply have a nozzle sticking inside that. Okay. And by the intake manifold sucking fuel, sucking air by that nozzle, it makes it run. Huh. So you, for sure when you take it apart and lay it all out on the counter, you think, this is impossible. It's never possibly going to run. Okay. It does. Somehow it runs. And it runs smoothly. At, you can go 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 mile an hour, mm -hmm. and it's no carburetor at all. So what you're calling the fire hose or fire nozzle, there's no actual fire in it, but that's where the gasoline is. Right. It's coming. simply a piece of tubing, a quarter inch <laughs> diameter piece of tubing, right. stuck in the float bowl, uh -huh. and it's extending into the intake tube, 
Yeah. And as the air is sucked by it, it uh -huh. pulls a little out of it. Okay. And makes it run. And that's it. Okay. That's it. There's no other parts in it. <laughs> There's no high speed circuit. There's nothing like that. Okay. Yet it runs perfect. These are your valves um, oh, to, to let the oil leave from the different portions of the engine. So you're letting oil out of each of these, but it's not the oil on the surface of the bottom of the pan. Each of these have standpipes like this. So when oh. this is threaded into the casing, the, the oil has to be at least this high when you drain it. Okay, got it. So if you added more oil to it, um, if you added more oil to it, you open this up and drain the extra oil out, but you're not draining it from the bottom, you're draining it from the standpipe from the top of this piece of tubing. Right on. And then between all of these, there's sections, which I can show you in the owner's manual. There's like a wall. So you can't drain one of them. You need to drain all six of them because you're gonna find that three or four will flow oil out of them. Uh -huh. And you may find that two or three don't flow any oil out. So there could be a chance if you're parked on a bad incline that the wall has, uh, uh, the, that the oil in, in, in a couple of them are drained pretty down, down pretty low. So you, before you start this up, you want to open up all these petcocks and make sure you have some flow coming out of all of them. And the very best way is to let them all drain out so then the oil simply gets down to this level, which is about two inches higher in the pan, then you're assured you have the right amount of oil. That's crazy. I mean, it totally makes sense. Never heard of that before. It's like having also six drain plugs. So I guess if you want to drain the oil all the way out, you just, um, you know. You just take this out. Take them all the way just out. Just take them all the way out yeah. if you want to actually drain the oil. Uh-huh. Um, but since the oil is, um, it's, it's a total loss car. The oil doesn't stay in the engine that long. There's leaks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still a good idea to drain it completely every two or three years to make sure nothing turns mm. into oil jelly. Yeah, right. Huh, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. And this is a long... <laughs> this is long over six piece. foot long. This is the transmission case and engine case. So it's divided up here and that's transmission, but it's one solid piece. So how can this possibly last and live in an era when they didn't have any, even any paved roads. Well, uh, Stevens Durier came up with a three-point suspension. So in the front, oh. there's, there's two mounting arms that are part of the casing. Incredibly strong mounting arms. Let's see if I can get a shot of that somehow. That's, the, that's one of the front okay. two arms. Yeah. Okay, right. And wow, it, those are massive. And in the rear, if it had two, as soon as you went over the first undulation, you would break the motor. So uh, what Stevens Durier came up with, they came up with a single point in the rear. That explains that. I remember seeing that and wondering what that was about. Now, you, now I know. And also the flywheel is supposed to be here. Here's the end of the motor mm -hmm. and there's the transmission. Right. There's no flywheel. There is a flywheel. Mm -hmm. It's on the front. Right on. Wow. And that's also massive, but it's on the front of the engine. Yep. Wow. Excellent. Okay. That's very interesting. Thanks. This is a carbide light arrangement for headlights. So you see the flame orifice inside of this. Yes, indeed. And so, in, so back here is the carbide pellets and the water. Okay. But we're talking about very wealthy people. Mm -hmm. And these, this wealthy family probably, probably got rid of all those horse things. So they want to park this when it's raining inside of their beautiful horse carriage garage building barn. But if they run the carbide generator yep. with, and they get it in at night and it's raining, they have to leave it outside for six hours because the carbide pellets and the water continually generates acetylene gas. Mm. So what this wealthy family did, they probably didn't use this carbide generator much. They have an acetylene tank, a hundred and 15 year old acetylene tank underneath the back seat. Wow. And they simply use that. So when they get home, they turn their acetylene off, which means it's generating no more gas. They can put it right into the carriage barn. Wow. So it's got dual plumbing system. It'll go from yes. the tank or from this tank. This yes. 
box here, this water box. And either way, it comes up here to this beautiful light. These lights are kerosene. Uh -huh. So the kerosene lights are bale handle kerosene lights. So if you wanted to, if you went to visit some of your friends <laughs> that didn't have electricity yet, because only 10% of the houses had electricity in 1907, sure. you could take this bale handle and you'd have a light for inside their house with your kerosene that's in the bottom of here. Wow. And also a way to, like a flashlight to guide your way to the house from the driveway or something. Yep. Wow, okay. And before you walk by, can we just talk about the back of this mirror with all the, the fittings and everything else is so well, amazing? Well, this is, uh, depending on how wide your road is or non-road is, uh -huh. you can take this butterfly and make the, the mirror come in and out like you can on your Chevy truck. Right. <laughs> or you can angle this, depending on how the height of the driver, you can, there's a ball joint here, so you can Let's angle see. your mirror so you can see exactly That's what you need beautiful. to see. And then if you wanted to configure your automobile in a different way, this yeah. is a folding top. So this top folds down if you want. Okay. And then also when it folds down, you can have this entire frame apparatus. Uh -huh. You can have it rotated back if you want. Okay. Because this is extendable and adjustable. So you oh, can make that. sure that you have the right amount of rake so yeah. you can make it look really racy as a five passenger touring if you wanted to. <laughs> right. Interesting. Okay. So that's so much adjustment. And uh, I don't see any plastic anywhere on this. No. Nope. It's pretty beautiful. Okay. The front seat is beautiful. Probably the original interior. Uh, there's even a wine box inside because wealthy people probably wanted their wine. So yeah. that's the wine box. Or at least a safe way to transport it. Maybe. <laughs> And then went to Costco. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, this is the original toolbox on the side, Stevens Durier. This is what you kept your, your pliers and your hammers in and your bailing wire. Okay. Because you remember at this time in history, there's no auto service centers. There's no dealerships. You had the mercantile and the back blacksmith. So otherwise, you did everything on your own. So this wow. is the original toolbox from 117 years ago. Still on there. Still operational, still has tools in it. That's amazing. My tools, but yeah, the insides are just what you'd expect for an open touring car. Wow. Uh, this, this here is for your legs. That was uh -huh. your blanket uh -huh. to keep you a little bit warmer. Yep. And then this is what you would, your turn signals, the back passengers would oh hold goodness. this out. You're going this way or you're turning that way. Now, are you kidding me? Is that a real thing? I don't know. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I usually take you very seriously, Alan, but I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> okay. It's four fingers and a thumb. Okay, I got you. It looks pretty good to me. Okay, we'll go with it. <laughs> wow, I'm just looking at how spacious this back seat is. That is massive. So on the rear of the car, Getting back to stagecoaches, yeah. if, uh, if this had the dumb iron extended to the back of the frame, mm -hmm. you'd have only two or three inches of rear suspension travel. But this mm -hmm. has got no dumb iron extending from the frame. It's got dumb iron that mounts a third string, spring in the center, which means, makes it, instead of having two inches of rear suspension travel per side, you have eight or ten inches of, of travel on each side. Wow. Like a stagecoach. Yeah. So they used technology from the 1860s to make this car ride nice. Interesting. And by when you use the the term dumb iron, I guess that's that's mounting points that doesn't don't move that are right. Hard to so touch. go to the back of the Delage real quick. Okay. And you can see a really good example of dumb iron. Okay. Right. That's so, extending. So that's a large piece of dumb iron. Yep. Okay. And that effectively just presents a mounting point so you can have a longer spring in this Correct. case. Okay. Okay, this car is the only one we've ever seen uh, that has an aviation steering wheel installed. This was not part of the Stevens Durier catalog whatsoever. This has got a double yoke like a 1907, 1908 airplane. Uh, and this is really neat, except when you try to drive it on a mountain road. You're, you're going around the bend, you're going around the 
all of a sudden you have no steering wheel left and your mind does not want you to put your hand in here backwards. So it's not very practical, but sitting clear, sitting still, it's unbelievably neat looking. Uh -huh. um, but it becomes a real challenge on a mountain road if you're traveling at a, at a brisk speed. And I imagine even if you hit a rut that wants to push the wheel one way or the other, this thing could really swing. I would well, it just, you, you, you want to have a steering wheel. Yeah. You don't want to have none of it. You have no wheel here in the bottom. Right. So as you go around the bend, you're, you're uh, doing a, a calisthenics and you're trying to figure out, okay, I'm holding on to something. I'm holding on to something. I mean, it's fascinating looking, I got to say. It really but is. But uh, I don't think they uh, wanted to make any more of them. Yeah. But in the early pictures from 1915, it always had this, this steering wheel, and the most interesting one in the world. Interesting. Uh, it's got a mag. So because it's got a mag, you can adjust your timing from the steering wheel. Uh -huh. And it's got a hand throttle on the steering wheel, too. So that's what the other two controls are. Okay. Well, that's, it's a beautiful piece of work. And it, maybe it... it was an experiment that turned out to just not quite work out. Maybe, but, but it stayed on there. Yeah. So, and I've driven it thousands of miles. Okay. You get used to it, but I could get a uh, tongue tied or finger tied by having your hand in the wrong spot. I mean, there's so much going on right there. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, but it's still, it's what it was. It's yeah. what it is. That's cool. The transmission. Yeah. It's progressive. Like a lot of the early cars. Okay. So it's got a progressive three speed transmission. Okay. And it shifts nicely. Reversed is all the way back. Neutral is here. First, second, and third. This is your parking brake. Nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. This is um, a speedometer. And it's a hydraulic speedometer. Uh, Veter made it. Mr. Veter ordered the car brand new. Uh, this was probably an experimental speedometer because I've never seen one in any of my catalogs, nor have I ever seen one in an automobile. It's a hydraulic speedometer. Really? Yep. So there's hydraulic pressure somehow coming out of that hose. Yeah, it makes that go up and down, makes okay. your reading go up and down. And the odometer is the is this, is the famous Veter uh, bicycle odometers they had on the 1880s to 1890s bicycle. So that's okay. what's on the side here. Now is this hydraulic speedometer, is this still operational? I don't have any fluid in it. Okay. So I it could be. Not sure, huh? Okay. Wow, that's really interesting looking. I feel like I want to take my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> this is your oiler box. Okay. Again, this is in the era of the total loss oil system. Uh -huh. So there's no oil pressure in the engine. Mm -hmm. It's a, the, there's a drive, which we covered earlier in right. the video from the water pump that spins a centrifugal pump inside of this oil box. And that, that centrifugal pump simply pumps oil into the top of all of these sight glasses and these are called the these are the drippers okay so these were the front of the engine the back of the engine the camshaft the mains and then as you drive you'll see drips dropping down from each of those right and we can see a little bit of that hose here or that pipe yeah that's that's where the power takeoff comes in right there uh -huh. and makes that bend so the centrifugal pump is below that and then this is your cap to fill it and that holds about two and a half quarts which is enough for about 150 miles. But even though this is a total loss engine, we still need to drain it because it doesn't really leave. It doesn't really make a mess. Okay. So at the end of the day, uh, you might drain the oil out of the pan, mm -hmm. um, your sectional sections in the pan, and you might strain it and you might pour it back into the oil box since you've only run that new oil one day and 150 miles. So the oil isn't bad right. yet. Well, what a convenient thing to have the oil fill for your engine running uh, right in the right here by the steering column. Yep. <laughs> and I see there's a sight glass here. It shows almost half full right at the moment. Yep. And you also know this is actually it's an idiot gauge, too, for the water pump, because as oh. long as you have drippers dropping oil from your drippers, yep. that means your water pump is still spinning because that water pump spinning motion is what turns the cable, which makes the drippers operate. So awesome. this is actually the drippers for the engine, which is lubrication. Mm -hmm. And it's also the idiot gauge for the water pump system. So I just, I love the double dual purpose. The water pump pushes the oil and then the oil sight glasses tell you about the water pump. Yes. <laughs> love it. That's fantastic. Uh, the clock is just a normal clock. It's probably a Stevens Jury clock. And I can't reach it over there. That knob, that knob 
Yeah. It's how we uh, adjust the, there's a basically a needle inside the, the hose, the, the, the jet yeah. inside of the float system. Uh -huh. So when you start it, you have it richer. And when you start getting it warmed up, you lean it down a little Oops. bit. Okay. So, yeah. So this is what you were calling a fire hose. This is that adjustment. For yes. That. Okay. And then we've got a couple buttons down here. It looks like it's a battery. That I can run it on, I can start it on the battery or start it on the mag. Uh -huh. So right now I'm using the mag. And then that bottom levers, I guess. Uh, the lights. That's your lights. Okay. Obviously an electrical connection there. Yep. Wow. Okay. And what about the pedals we have looking at down here? Well, as we've learned before, all smooth pedals are the gas pedals. Right. Okay. So, and then the other two are clutch and brake in the normal position. But your okay. gas pedal is in the center like most of the early cars. Interesting. So many steering wheels are on the right side on these older cars. Is that pretty common in your experience? Yeah, it, almost all of them are on the right side because oh. all the stagecoaches, they were on the right side. Uh, they were on that side because uh, the stagecoaches, the driver needed to look at, on the edge of the road because you could go off the edge. Okay. And you didn't have to worry about the other side because the horses are smart enough not to run into each other, no matter how <laughs> fast the horses are going. But they found that after about 15 years making automobiles, automobiles are pretty darn dumb. Yeah. There was a lot of head-on collisions on cars. They would run into each other. Okay. So then they moved the steering wheel to the other side in about 1916 in most brands, and the head-on collisions went way down. So what you're saying, we went from looking out for the edge of the road to looking out for the edgy driver. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. I mean, my, my dumb dad jokes. Let really original. I, wow. Probably original. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's incredible. It's wow. always had that same color, so I think it's original. Yeah. Leather will last a couple hundred years. This is hinged too, I guess, huh? Yeah. Look at that. Beautiful. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna prime the engine. It's been several months since we started this car. Okay. It wouldn't matter if it's been several minutes. You know, there's no accelerator pump. There's no choke. The only way you're gonna get fuel under the intake manifold is, is prime it. Your fuel right now is sitting three foot below this. And unless you're really spinning it over fast, you're never going to have anything in the intake manifold. Right. So you prime it so the, the fuel is exactly where you want it to go. Yeah. Excellent, well done.
right? <laughs> the height of luxury and smoothness. It is. Like, I can actually understand, especially compared to a Mitchell, two, like a year or two older, that was not anything like this, really. I can really tell the difference. Nothing against the Mitchell, but this is just really amazing. I guess it would be like having a, you know, a, a whole bunch of children and realizing they're all unique and different, but you love them all. And here you have all these different cars and they're truly unique. They're all absolutely different. Their personalities are completely different and the care you have to give them and the way you make them and encourage them to run is completely different. But mm -hmm. you do that and you feel accomplished. Yeah, very good, Alan. Well, thank you for taking the world along for a look and a ride and hear it start and run on this 1907 Stevens Durier. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.